Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this week's service, whether you call Epicenter your church or it's your first time joining us. Today we're continuing on our series on the book of Revelation, and we'll be covering a significant amount of scripture. We will be tackling Revelation chapter 17 and going to Revelation chapter 19 verses 10. We will not be covering each verse, but we will be doing an overview that will clarify its symbolic meaning. But make sure and make these two and a half chapters part of your devotionals throughout the week. Whether you're new to the church or even if you just want to catch up on the past sermons on this series, you can scan the QR code displayed on the screen on your mobile device that will direct you to our YouTube channel playlist for this series. If you don't have a mobile device, you can simply go to YouTube, find our channel, which is Wadena Epicenter, and click on the playlist to access the previous sermons from this series. As we go through the message, we want to encourage you to follow along with your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, make sure and let us know we have one for you. And make sure and jot down some notes on your worship program. If you have kids between the ages of 4 and 6th grade, we have Epicenter Kids that's currently in progress and they can join them at any time. If you have little ones that are 0 to 3 year olds, we do have a parent room available where you can go and listen to the message and also watch it while your little ones play. Also, we have little tablets available for the kids at the info table if they'd like to stay in the service and have something to scribble on throughout this. different. I don't buy into the politically correct mentality that we're all the same. Who's tired of the whole politically correct mentality where you can't, you know, we do things different. I don't buy into the hype. We're all the same. To say that we're all the same, we're all equal, but to say we're all the same denies God's creation as far as I'm concerned. He knew what he was doing. He made us all a little bit different. Look how we parent. Each ethnic group does it a little bit different. No one gives better parental advice than my white brothers and sisters. You guys give statistics and facts. <laughs> you guys have flyers on the refrigerator. It's beautiful. <laughs> Just say no, Billy. <laughs> a Mexican mom doesn't give statistics. She doesn't give facts. She'll just give examples. <laughs> You're going to end up like your cousin Lupe. <laughs> Today's message is not about how to parent, but based on personal experiences growing up in a Mexican household. And I can tell you that it's easier hearing examples than hearing statistics or reading a flyer on the fridge. I did have a cousin Lupe, but I didn't want to end up like my cousin Juan either. And, you know, all kidding aside, though, if we were to keep it real... We all have a family member that is a poster child of disappointment, right? I mean, that's just a real thing. If you don't know who that is, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Maybe I can soften the blow by putting it this way. You still have time to change. Um, but all messing around set aside, it's a real thing. Every family can get a point across, and it's easier to use an example of the embodiment of everything that you should not aspire to be in a family member, right? They'll say, you know, you're going to end up like this person. Maybe it's just a Mexican thing. I heard it all the time. But using examples, sometimes it's quicker to get the point across than having to try to use statistics or try to put different ideas that ultimately it's going to get to the same point. Now, the interesting part about today's message is that the Bible uses those kind of euphemisms or substitutes when describing the embodiment of wickedness and spiritual disappointment. In the passages that we're going to be covering today, which is a number of them, we're going to be covering them quickly, we, we see this Mexican approach to parenting that is going to come out very clear in chapter 17 and 18. But before we actually get to the identity of this poster child of disappointment and spiritual depravity, wickedness, rebellion, you know, everything that the church should not aspire to be, the, these chapters are actually going to give us some imagery that will kind of help us to understand it in a better way. So as we've gone through this series on the book of Revelation, something that's really difficult is the symbolism behind it. There's a lot of things that 
are said that don't mean what is being said, right? There's no dragon. That's simply the devil. There is, as we're going to be talking about today, there's a prostitute, but it's not really a prostitute. It's something different. What the Bible is helping us to understand is using allegory as a driving point home. If you don't know what an allegory is, let me give you an example. Pretend for a second that you end up having an argument with a relative. After the argument, you know, it gets heated up, and all of a sudden you, you realize that, man, this relative of yours is just like a sailor. Now, they don't have to be on a ship, they don't have to go on a cruise, they don't have to do anything with the ocean, but you know exactly what they're, where they're, that's going. They are, they've got the mouth of a sailor, you know, they curse like sailors. Why? Say, are all sailors the same? And the answer is no. But there is an understanding, allegorically, that we understand that a sailor ultimately represents somebody that has a really foul mouth. This becomes a poster child for a potty mouth, right? So that's an allegory. We're using allegorical language to ultimately paint a picture of something greater. So as we get into... Chapter 17, now that it's clear as mud, right? We have the poster child of disappointment. We have allegories. The, the chapter opens up by saying that one of the angels, which had poured out one of the seven bowls of judgment, which we've already covered, shows John, the writer of the book of Revelation, a judgment that is going to come upon and fall on the great prostitute that rules over many waters. Once again, allegory. This easygoing woman, we'll just put it that way, has influence and power that is going to break territorial boundaries. This woman is seen by John sitting on top of a beast that we have already discovered and talked about in previous weeks. It's not an actual beast, but this beast has seven heads and ten horns and it has blasphemies that is written all over it. Blasphemy would be insults or slander towards God. That's, that's what this beast has written all over it. So once again, what is being described is not a literal prostitute sitting on a weird-looking animal. That, that's not what, John, what John's vision is trying to convey. It's an allegory. The, verse, the verses that follow actually give us some clues along the way by saying that the kings of the world have committed adultery with this prostitute. And the people who are not of God, the people of the world, have gotten drunk off of the wine of her immorality. It's, it's, a, it's really hard to kind of break it apart. We're going to be doing that today. But this wine that has gotten other people drunk has also gotten her drunk. Now, as John is describing this, imagine just kind of waking up from a dream and, and seeing exactly what he's just portraying. He's amazed. That's what it says. You know, he's, he's astonished at what he's seeing. And it's not in a good way. It's in a, in a bad way. The angel who showed him this vision reveals the symbolic meaning behind it. The beast is depicted as a scarlet beast. And the woman is said to be wearing purple and scarlet clothing, fine jewelry, and really what that's telling us, it's, it's a sign of luxury and prosperity. In other words, the beast and this prostitute lack nothing, and you actually see it in, the, in that chapter. Now, these two figures are, once again, not literal, and they're not broke, at least not yet. Okay, so we already tackled the beast uh, a few weeks back. But I want to quickly recap it because it's going to play a significant factor today. And we're going to, I'm going to get myself into some hot water today, I'm sure. But I want to recap it quick. Verses 9 through 13 record that the angel who is unraveling this mystery to John tells him that these two figures, uh, that this regarding the figure of the beast. So it says, This calls for a mind with understanding. This is the angel speaking. The seven heads of the beast, once again, there, there's no suggesting, there's a lot of people that try to understand this literal, the angel's telling you it's not literal. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. So it's telling you, that's what the beast means. 
And then it tells you what that entails. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns during John's time. And the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power, and they will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. We're talking about superpowers. We're talking about, it doesn't seem so foreign. It's talking about something that we understand on a daily basis. It's, it's nations. It's countries. And these countries will agree to give him, the beast, the Antichrist, their power and their authority. So once again, this beast is not in the cryptozoology category. It's not like uh, um, it's not like Bigfoot. It's not like Loch Ness monster. It's nothing like that. It's simply allegorical. What it is revealing is superpowers of the world, and this is what the angel described to John that have either existence or existed were in existence during John's time, some that have already come to pass since John's time to us, but then it's leading to one final beast, one final kingdom, one final power that will rise up before Jesus returns. There's nothing abnormal about this. There are different views as to who these superpowers are. We've already tackled that as well in this series whether they are <clears throat> superpowers or nations that could have been in history or even maybe individuals themselves. And you can check out that message on YouTube with the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. That's where we tackled that. And once again, you can catch up on those topics, whether you were not able to join us or if you fell asleep. Jonathan, I'm speaking to you, buddy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just because it's in the dark doesn't mean that I can't see you. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of light coming from this side. But the symbolic meaning, I'm kidding, Jonathan, I, I really am, kind of. Uh, the symbolic meaning of the beast are nations and rulers who have been in power and have played a factor in history and are going to play a factor in the future. Now, we're going to break down the meaning of the beast in just a minute, but it's all so intertwined that you almost have to like completely separate it to see it a little bit more clearly. So we're going to come back to it. But the symbolic meaning of the prostitute is actually revealed in the final verse. Once again, because I'm not trying to tell you what you should believe, but if you are a follower of Christ, I'm just simply telling you this is what the Bible that you claim to hold on to states. The angel tells John in verse 18, this woman you saw in your vision, now this is extremely important, so really kind of like try to ingrain this into your mind for just a few minutes. This woman that you saw, the prostitute that you saw in your vision represents a great city, it's a city, that rules over the kings of the world. Okay. So the prostitute is not a woman. Actually, it's, it's, it's a city. The woman is described as a great city who has great authority over rulers of the earth. Verse 15 tells us that the waters where the woman rules over represents masses of people of every nation and language. In other words, there's no barrier. This woman has influence, not only with rulers and authority, but people of every nation. But when we, then we get this really interesting little piece of information. And it says that the woman is mounted on top of a beast that has a seven heads. And this is what verse 9 states, if you have your Bible highlighted, because it's important. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. It's going, to be, um, it's going to get really warm in here pretty soon. But one thing that I hope that our church is interested in is being grounded on the truth regardless of how offensive it may be to any of us. And while we don't want to be dogmatic, especially in the book of Revelation, right? The book of Revelation has many different views and interpretations. We don't want to be dogmatic. And this is a topic of much debate. We also don't want to leave any stone unturned that could very well contain information that is hidden in plain sight. 
right? We, we don't want to ignore it just because it might be offensive. We want to turn every stone and, and see exactly what it means. So with that being said, I want to show you a picture in just a second, and I want to have a conversation regarding this very intriguing and hard passage to go through. Because this passage has given us this visual allegory. The angel has explained it. And this is what we have. This would be the simplest way to get to where we're going to be going to. We have a woman that is described as a city, and some scholars interpret a couple of things out of this. Regardless of what the interpretation might be, one thing that is mostly, if not completely agreed upon, is that this woman is going to be some kind of religious organization. Now, the reason why is because the church is typically depicted as a woman. It's feminine, not masculine. And, and there's a reason for it, because Christ is the bridegroom, right? He, he's, a, he's a groom. And there's many examples of God's people being referred to as a woman. I'll give you a couple, but one of them is actually found in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, which records a really interesting actual allegory where Hosea is told to do something that's really bizarre and really interesting. It says this, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate, it's an illustration, it's a real one, but it's an illustration. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. It's a really interesting way to look at it. That ultimately Israel is a city, right? Or Israel has a city, which is Jerusalem, mainly uh, attributed to God's people. And here's the judgment upon Israel. And the way that Israel is going to see the bigger picture is through the prophet Hosea marrying a prostitute to illustrate how they have prostituted themselves and gone to other gods. So the great prostitute that is depicted here has more to do with spiritual infidelity than anything else. It's not talking about sexual immorality. I'm not saying that that can't be part of it, but that's not the point. It is people claiming to be of God that are not faithful to God in their practices, just like we got in the example of Hosea. And the prophet Jeremiah, that's a second example that I'll use. There's a lot more, but the prophet Jeremiah uses the same illustration of prostitution to describe Israelites or Israel's spiritual infidelity to God. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1 states, But you have prostituted yourself with many lovers, so why are you trying to come back to me, says the Lord. So we, we see people who have strayed from God and all of a sudden another wanting to come back. And the picture keeps getting clearer, right? This is not a, an actual prostitute that John just sees and it's just weirded out. It's, it's something greater. So the woman by scholars, is understood to be a religious institution who has abandoned their commitment to God and have given themselves over to the practices of the world. The best word to use would be this is an apostate church uh, or a rogue church, if you were to call it that, right? They, they've strayed from the truth. They're no different than the world. But this church, this religious organization, this city has influence over nations and languages, right? It, it carries through. And this great city, this great prostitute, this great religion that has much influence rules. It's represented to sit on the beast with seven head, heads, which, once again, represents a city that sits upon seven hills, that would be the easiest way to, to put it. So here is one view that some people may refuse to accept, and, and that's completely between you and God. That's not between me and you. Um, and actually, it may very well bother you that I even brought it up, and that's okay, because once again, we're interested in the truth. I'm not interested in tickling your ears. And what we want is the truth, not the version of the truth that suits us best. So here's the image that I promise. The seven hills of Rome... And you will see where its outline is. Those are seven hills. 
And if you look at the top left corner of the image, you will see maybe a name that some of you are familiar with. And it is the smallest city and country in the world known as the Vatican. Once again, this is just simply putting it from what it is. So here's a prostitute that sits over seven hills, and that's where she rules from. She has influence over peoples of every nation, every language. And there's a lot of things that as we see through the passage, it's really difficult to reconcile any other way. And one of the things that it says is that this prostitute is drunk, drunk with blood. And one thing that we can understand from the, the Catholic Church, if we were to move back in time, is that the Crusades led to mass killing of individuals, and it was done in the name of God. Just like the depiction of prostitution is not sexual in its revelation, the drunk prostitute has not tipped the wine bottle too much. Verse 6 actually states, so once again, I'm encouraging you, read these chapters. Um, Verse 6 states that she was drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus, which once again, we, we understand that there's more there. And if you were to think about drunkenness, if you were to see it symbolic, allegorical language, drunkenness happens when you overindulge or you do something in excess. What it's telling you is this city, this church, this religion, ultimately has killed a lot of people and they're drunk on it. And they're getting other people drunk on it too. And and we could see it in two different ways. Spiritual implication and physical implication, right? So it could be death here on earth where people were killed in the name of God. We see that with ISIS, that they're doing that. And even in John, um, I'm trying to remember the chapter and the verse, but... uh, uh, Jesus, I think it's chapter 14 or chapter 16 where Jesus says that there will be a time where people will come and they will think that they are doing God a service by killing in his name. And, and we understand that with the terrorist organizations. But the other implication in having blood in your hands is you don't have to kill a person to be guilty of some kind of consequence. If you are deceiving people away from God, those people will be in hell. And guess what? That is on your hands because you deceived them. So there's a couple of ways that we could look at this. Now, the interesting part about this as well is that the wealthy prostitute also held this gold goblet full of obscenities and impurities of her immorality. And this is a little bit harder to try to see, well, how does that even tie in? And I think that, once again, we have to see it for what it is. We can't necessarily just see it as, well, here's this goblet and it has all these things. No. It has obscenities and it has impurities that are immoral. Now, immorality can be sexual for sure, but it can also, once again, as we saw, it could be spiritual. And here's a couple of things to consider really quickly. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5, gives us part of the Ten Commandments. And this is what it says. This is a command given by God to God's people. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow to them or worship them. I don't think this is going to take you by surprise. I don't think I'm revealing anything that's, that's weird. I think if you walk into a cathedral, if you walk into a Catholic church, there will be no shortage of engraved images of saints, which, once again, it doesn't matter how religious you want to make it. It's a command. There's no shortage of depiction of angels. Not to mention the obscenity that it would be to, when it says not to bow to anything, to have to bow to a man that is a priest. When Jesus, and then here's the second obscenity, which is even more crucial, right? 
When Jesus states this, it's not my words, it's Jesus. You could write this reference down, Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. It says, And don't address anyone here on earth as Father, for only God in heaven is your Father. Let me break it to you. The priest is not your daddy. And the Pope, or the priest, is not God's spokesman. He's not God on earth. That's simply not the case. What is happening is they are positioning themselves in a way that it actually begins to sound more like the Antichrist, right? They, they receive the worship. Here's a bow. They are God's mouthpiece. You can't question what they say. And, and once again, as we go through the passage, there's no shortage of parallels that can be drawn to the Catholic Church. And, and the biggest thing, of course, that, that really ties it really well is the seven hills that I showed you the picture of. However, here's one thing to consider. Like I said, we're interested in the truth, so not just one perspective, but many perspectives. Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, states that the seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules, but they also represent seven kings, seven individuals. Which presents a little bit of a challenge when you're trying to really geographically point it to Rome. Now, that's not to say that there is no truth in that. But at the same time, it's difficult because the region is so condensed to have seven kings ruling from that area that ultimately has... It's not necessarily a kingdom right now. As much as the Vatican is considered a country, that area, it's actually outside the seven hills, not on top of it. So for that reason, some people speculate that maybe this is not referring to the Catholic Church, but it's referring to the people of Israel, more specifically Jerusalem, which once again, we saw the examples of that. The other possibility would be a liberal church who continues to adopt cultural trends rather than standing on the truth. Now here's the thing, it doesn't diminish the problems with the Catholic Church. I'll stand on that, because there are many issues. But it also doesn't mean that it's only one. So you have to see it from that perspective. It doesn't just have to be one. It could actually be what is known as an ecumenical religious movement. This would be an all-inclusive movement that is rooted in cultural, non-biblical religious practices, right? Just like we talked about last week, the Antichrist. There will be no shortage of religious people when the end draws near. There will be much religion, but it's not rooted in biblical principles. So either way, here's a kicker, and it's a really big kicker. This religious organization or nation or church, whatever it ends up being, gives itself, just like a prostitute, over to the world, spiritually depraved. And then Revelation chapter 17, verse 16 says that the scarlet beast and his ten, and his ten horns, which the prostitute was sitting upon, right? It's ruling from right there. This is what it says. They all hate the prostitute. That's a kicker. So here's a prostitute that's ruling, and it's like, okay, well, this religious organization looks no different than the world, ultimately ruling, having much influence all over nations, so forth and so on. And here's what's going to happen. The beast that it's sitting upon, this kingdoms, or these kingdoms, this superpower, they're all going to turn on her like a wild beast that it is. If you remember, when... We talked about the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. We, we talked about how the description is, suits it well. Because here's the thing. A wild beast, as cuddly as a polar bear may be, you do not want to go and give it a hug. As much as Coca-Cola depicts it as a really nice thing, it will maul you and kill you because it's a wild beast. And that's what's going to happen. Here's this prostitute, this, this church, this religious organization that's sitting on top of the beast. The beast hates it. And my wife and I were talking about this yesterday. It's interesting how the church continues to try to be so relevant with the culture. And, you know, it, it's, it's moving in these progressive ideologies that we know for a fact are abandoning the truth of biblical inerrancy. And, and they're moving towards it, and, and they don't care. It's simply compromising and here's the thing. Have you noticed how the, how, how the world doesn't really care much for Jesus' teachings? They hate it. As a matter of fact, 
if you were to really put it into perspective, the world today hates the prostitute just as much as it's going to hate it then. They don't care about the church. They're simply looking for an inclusive environment that will ultimately not talk about the difficulties of their sin. And these powers, these um, nations will rip the spiritual, unfaithful religious organization to shreds. And once again, I mean, we, we see how, and I'm going to say faith, not religion, even though religion can be used in that sense. You can actually see how faith is hated by countries. Did you know that China, it's illegal to actually have a Bible? Did you know that there are other places that suppress what the Bible teaches? The nations don't care for the church, nor will it care for a church that compromises and tries to be relevant to the culture. It will rip it to shreds. As much as they're trying to be part of the world, these nations hate it. So in the beginning of the chapter, we're actually told who this spiritually disappointing family member is. And the name of this disappointing family member is known as Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities of the world. That's what it actually said. So there, there's the identity, right? There's a disappointing family member. So if the church continues to compromise the truth, they are going to end up like their sister Babylon. That, that's really the way to look at it. Some scholars believe that this religious organization may actually be established or based out of the region of Babylon. But I believe that the best way to understand it is in light of understanding that Babylon is not directing us to the map. It's revealing the spiritual condition of a church that is unfaithful to God, just like Babylon was spiritually dead, even though it was economically prosperous. And at the height of the kingdom, it was powerful which is what we see. So chapter 17 captures a religious, influential, global organization that the beast hates. As we turn the chapter, we see an economically prosperous and powerful Babylon that is mourned by those who were in relationship with her. So you see a prostitute that dies, and everybody's like, we hate her, we can't stand her. Turn the chapter, you see a prostitute that the people that are in relationship with her begin to cry over her. And for that reason, it presents a question. So is chapter 17 recording a different Babylon than chapter 18? And I believe that the answer is yes. And that's the reason that we have to see it in the Mexican approach to parenting. You don't want to end up like your cousin Lupe, right? You don't want to end up like Babylon. So... The way that we can see that it's two different systems, once again, and I just said it, it's that one is mourned when it's destroyed, and the other one, it's almost, a, it's almost something that is carried out by the nations. The first one, carried out by the nations, they hated her, they turned against her. The second one, it's destroyed, and all of a sudden, now they're crying. They're mourning. So as we turn to chapter 18, verse 1, John starts off by saying, and don't worry, we're going to move through this pretty quickly because it just records a lot of the same, um, the same things. It's talking about the luxuries that it has, so forth and so on, which is the reason that I encourage you to go and read it afterwards. But John, John starts off by saying this in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. After all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the, great, or sorry, and the earth grew bright with a splendor. He gave a mighty shout, Babylon is fallen, the great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. Once again, same family member. Two different systems, counterfeit faith, Babylon, and politically, economically, luxurious Babylon, they both fall. So this chapter, once again, I'm not going to go through it completely. It's, it's just going to record a lot of the commodities and luxuries of the day that maybe they're not the same today. I mean, I don't think many of us think of cinnamon as something that's luxurious, right? But what it's trying to portray is more so the luxuries of the day that will be gone. And it, it's telling you, this is what the great wicked city had to offer, and now it's gone. The great city is told to turn it, or is, is stated to be 
turned into a pile of rubble. It becomes a home for demons, which means it's just desolate, right? I mean, uh, demons in the wilderness. The chapter states that there will no longer be sounds of wedding celebrations. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you do. I'm just simply saying, if you have ever seen the movie World War Z with Brad Pitt, um, that, that's what you should picture, right? This post-apocalyptic scene, almost, even if you were to go a different route, almost after a nuclear bomb has decimated everything. That's, that's what it's described here. There's smoke ascending. These sailors are, or captains and merchants are watching from the side, and, and they're mourning the loss of the city that has been destroyed. Revelation chapter 18, verse 21 states that a mighty angel picked up a boulder size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. This great, the city of great wealth and the pinnacle of earthly success, right? What, what most kingdoms aspire to be, a superpower, is described to be destroyed. And, and here's the interesting part. It doesn't take place gradually, right? It's not like it's moving in that direction of destruction. It says that in a single moment, it is utterly destroyed. And based on what we kind of see in that passage, the fact of the matter is, if you were to have nuclear war take place, most cities would be annihilated, not with time, but in a single moment. Miles will be destroyed. And actually what you would see is just smoke ascending to the heavens. And that's what verses 17 and 18 state. All the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend and they will say, where is there another city as great as this? And, and this is another thing that most scholars are divided on. Is this describing a single city, or is it describing a city that represents a nation as a whole? And quite frankly, we're not certain. But I believe that it's more likely that this city represents an entire nation that is a, a nation that is a superpower in the world, and controls and influences most of the world economy. And it's because of what you see in that passage. The people that are mourning the destruction of this great city, they don't seem to be concerned with human loss. As a matter of fact, all that they're talking about is how this is going to affect their trade and their profit. They're more concerned about how this is going to affect their pockets than how it's going to affect human loss. They list off things that will no longer be able to be purchased from this city or this nation. And the entire chapter is capturing the devastation of a powerful nation who in a single moment, and in some translations uh, write in a single hour, it, it had economic influence and power stripped away from what seems to be a, a country or a city that is unparalleled by any other nation, country, or city in the world. And Babylon, now as we're wrapping it up, Babylon is simply an example, a word, a name that is helping us to understand historically fallen systems of depravity, wickedness, greed, right? It's helping us to see that bigger picture, that, that family member, that spiritual family member that you do not want to aspire to be. And what it's telling us is this, the spirit of Babylon continues to reincarnate itself through time, but there will be a moment where it will be abolished indefinitely. And that's what the book of Revelation is recording. Using biblical symbolisms and examples of historical nations who are driven by demonic influence to pursue the things that will eventually come to an end. Understand that, and this is something that's really hard for us to picture, uh, I know I mentioned this at youth group, and, and, it's, and it's hard for us to understand. We live in a world that we believe that everything that exists is simply what we can see, and, and, and that's it. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are, 
We are not simply natural. There is a supernatural force that operates in the midst of everything that is taking place that influences the decisions that we make and that others make towards us. And what we're seeing is that Babylon is a system that is demonically driven and pulling us to the things that the world has to offer instead of the godliness that we should be pursuing. And and using biblical symbolism, that's what it's doing. And the book of Revelation is pointing us to that climatic final moment when the spirit of rebellion and deception will be completely done with. It's, it's, It's over with. The following 10 verses of chapter 19 record songs of celebration and victory that take place in heaven when judgment and and the end of wickedness comes to pass. Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 and 2 state, After this I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And, And this is where most people in their ignorance, believe that God is malevolent for carrying out justice against humanity. And and this is what verse 2 records. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute. The difficult part is that we typically don't see us as being spiritually unfaithful to God because we believe that we are good enough in in the condition that we are in. So understand that what chapter 19 is recording is this eruption in heaven that There's a celebration that justice is carried out. It's done. So let me put it a different way so that we really capture why heaven celebrates at this moment. All the things that we we see in the world today that seem unfair, justice will be carried out. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right? All the things that Ecclesiastes records where, where King Solomon is saying, you know, why is it that this happens and, and the good people suffer? Why does this? It's all going to be judged. All the hits that people have thrown at you and you wonder why God isn't doing any, anything about it? Yeah, I've been there. God will be the judge. Heaven will erupt in celebration. And I will be there to celebrate too. All the senseless murders of people, right? And those murderers who delight and are unrepentant about what their actions were, they will be judged. Every senseless, wicked, and unrepentant action from the moment of creation to the moment of his return will be judged by the creator of the universe. And the heavens will erupt in rejoicing because God is just. And here's the reason that heaven rejoices, because there's no partiality. And and this is how we know this, that God in his grace did not have to extend mercy, but he did. And grace has been extended, but the people refused to accept that grace and to repent. And now the day of judgment has finally come. Last week, we talked about an individual who will set up himself as an object of worship, known as the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. And as stated last week, and I'll wrap up with this, the byproduct of the Antichrist is already at work today. And this passage is helping us to see that more clearly. The book of Revelation seems so weird to us because of movies that we see that just seem so disconnected. It's simply revealing the physical things that are going to take place from a spiritual perspective. And the thing is that as much as this seems so foreign, the change is subtle that it doesn't even feel like change. Like, like we see some of these pass- passages and we're like, yeah, we must be pretty far away from that still. And, and there's this story, this parable, that fits this really well. It said something around the line, lines of, place a frog in a pot of boiling water and it will jump out immediately. But if you place a frog in a pot filled with water at room temperature and you gradually increase the heat, the frog will never understand when it died until it's dead because it's slowly heating up. Drastic changes will cause people to jump out, but change the condition slowly and gradually, which the devil is really patient about doing it in that manner, and people won't even know what killed them until they're dead. And from everything that we see in Scripture, we are far 
from room temperature water. People are spiritually dead already. They just don't see it. People seek religion without change and repentance. Or if not, they seek religion that they can stand behind to feel good about themselves, but it only medicates the broken condition. We can easily be deceived into a religious system that looks appealing appealing to us and to others, but at the end of the day, there is no distinction between us and the world. I mean, it's always nice when people, man, you're so godly, you're so this. But is that true godliness or is that just simply a, a facade trying to fool people? And once again, not that we walk perfect. That's impossible. But we continue to move forward by his grace as we fall. To put it a different way, when we fall, we fall forward. We don't fall backwards. And we will fall because that's a human condition. And churches can try to promote a message of grace that falls in line with the world. But once again, you, you could try to be trendy. You could try to you know, make sense of things in, in a way that ultimately you don't come offensive. The world hates the gospel. You're simply promoting religion, not godliness. Successful, prosperous, and powerful Babylon, the poster child of what seems almost to be like the American dream, what we should be aiming for, will come to ruin because of its wickedness. And we typically don't see those things as wicked. We're just simply trying to get ahead or, or, or be better. But here's the problem. The heart of the problem is not the system in place that provides goods. The problem with the system is a heart that defines what people begin to chase after. It's pulling us away from God. It's all the things that will make us happy, or at least we believe will make us happy, but it's simp- simply temporary. So... If you're still not seeing the, the temperature of the room where we're at, you know, and I'm not talking about this physical, uh, I'm, I'm using, um, I'm simply using this as an example. If you're trying to figure out where we're at in the pot with the water, and maybe how dead we are where we're at, let me show you one final image that hopefully will paint a picture of not religious Babylon, we've talked about that last week and today but the economical side of it. The United States of America is the world's most dominant economic and military power. If our country would fall, it would be a devastation to the economy globally. It it just wouldn't affect the U.S., And as much as we are weakening through weak leadership and foolish decisions coming from the top, the United States is the most dominant economic and military, uh, powerful military. But here's the thing. We often think of the United States as a, no doubt, great place to live. But we often think about money uh, almost like as a hedge of protection that will keep us safe. If the stock market collapsed today, our economy would be devastated. It's only one single action. It's not many, it's just one. In a single moment, we would be ruined. If we were to simply pick one city, let's just say one city in the United States, to represent economic power influence, and trading in America, which city would it be? What was that? New York City, right? I mean, we, we, we see that as a pinnacle. I didn't even, I didn't do that on purpose. I was totally, you know. but it's New York City, right? We, we would see that as a pinnacle of the nation. The utter destruction of that city would be a symbol of a collapsed nation that seemed too powerful to fall. So if you really want to tie this spiritually, I believe that we're in Babylon. We just don't see it. Because the temperature was gradually raised. And people are spiritually dying. If something were to happen to New York City... It doesn't matter whether people love or hate America. 
the people that trade with it would be devastated. Not because of the loss of life, but because of what that would mean financially for their country. Something else that this passage includes, and it's really interesting, it, talk, it talks about drugs. It actually talks about uh, pharmakeia, which would be drugs. Some people associate that to um, the, the medical field, you know, big pharma. Some others attribute it to drugs, uh, like illegal, illicit drugs. But nonetheless, another interesting thing is Revelation chapter 19, verse 13 says that they also trade a lot of bodies. And it actually tells right there, this is human slaves. Now, it sounds foreign, as slavery was abolished in 1865, right? That, that doesn't happen anymore. But this is what one source stated. An estimated 50 million people were living in modern slavery on any given day, and that was two years ago in 2021. 50 million people. If you want to kind of break it down and try to picture what that looks like globally, this is nearly one in every 100 people and had 150 people in the world. In 150 people, one person is leaving as a slave. The merchants that are mentioned here in Revelation engage in human trafficking as well. It doesn't sound so foreign. It, it, it's weird when you're seeing it through the uh, allegories and when you're hearing Babylon, which we don't understand who that family member is. But understand that a slave is not one that works the field, but one whose rights have been taken away and are under the control of an, another individual. There is a reason, and you have to understand this, there is a reason that heaven erupts in celebration. Because it is done. No more. Evil has come to an end, and Jesus is the one who puts an end to it. Dad's in the room, steps up, done. No more. Grace is done. Until that moment comes, here's, here's what I want to wrap up with for you personally, for each one of us personally. Regardless of what you've done or what you're convinced of that God is unable to forgive you of, his grace is sufficient. And, and one of the things that religious people will do, and I've known a couple of religious people in, in, in the time of ministry and even before then, the only hope for the condition of our culture nation, the temperature of the room to change is not found in the White House. It's not found in politicians. It, it's not found in a better economy, even though those things can help. It's not even found in religion. It is only through true godliness that things can change. And that can only take place when people speak the gospel, hear the gospel, and internalize the gospel. Let's pray.